tonight. On behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am thrilled to welcome Jennifer Weiner for a reading and discussion of her latest novel, Fly Away Home. In this Miss Weiner's seventh novel, we meet Sylvie and Richard Woodruff and their two daughters, Diana and Lizzie. In typical Jennifer Weiner fashion, we are brought into the complicated lives of three remarkable and diverse women as they navigate betrayal, loss, and rediscovery. The Providence Journal calls the book sharp, hysterical, thoughtful, and Booklist says that Weiner's trademark blend of wit and sensitivity distinguishes this timely tale about a family in crisis. Jennifer Weiner, as you may know, is extremely awesome. She grew up in Connecticut <laughs> and attended Princeton University, where she took creative writing courses with the likes of John McPhee, Toni Morrison, and Joyce Carol Oates. Before her career as a novelist, Miss Weiner was an active journalist writing for Salon.com, Red Book, Glamour, L17, tons of other places. She's the author of numerous books, including Good in Bed, Little Earthquakes, the short story collection, The Guy Not Taken, and Best Friends Forever. There are more than 11 million copies of Miss Weiner's books in print in over 35 countries. And as you know, her novel In Her Shoes was turned into a major mo motion picture starring Cameron Diaz and Shirley MacLaine. Some of you might know that Miss we Weiner had a cameo appearance in the film as the smiling woman in the Italian market. <laughs> and she's also appeared on the Today Show, CBS Early Show, and the Martha Stewart Show. We're so thrilled that she is here with us tonight. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Jennifer Weiner. I am, I am so sorry I'm late. Um, anyone who was following me on Twitter knows what happened. I, I was on a plane, and then they had mechanical difficulties, and they had to deplane us, which I didn't know was a word outside of Fantasy Island. <laughs> They're like, no, no, deplane, deplane. I'm like, really? So. Yeah, so we deplaned, and, and then I hung out in the lobby and answered questions on Twitter, which was fun, and then they found a new plane for us, and I got back on, and, and then I fell asleep, and then there was turbulence, and so here I am, and um, Heather, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, a couple of years ago, when I was on tour for Little Earthquakes, I had to do a reading at a bookstore that had been flooded, and they had to move all the books, and they had to tear up the carpets, and they had me reading in this concrete floored room that was like their loading dock, and it had like a drain in the center, and I kept looking around for Jeffrey Dahmer. It was kind of freaky, and, and, and the poor owner of the bookstore was incredibly apologetic about this and really, really embarrassed, and he kept saying how sorry he was, and he felt so terrible, and you know, I, of course, as the oldest child of divorced parents, am, am trying to you know, let him know that it's okay, and, and don't worry, it's fine, we'll make do. Mom and dad still love us even though they can't live together. <laughs> and um, this poor guy walks through the crowd and stands behind the podium and leans into the microphone and says, here's Jennifer, sorry about the smell. <laughs> <laughs> um, and all I was thinking was they usually wait till I'm done speaking before they say that. But um, so I, in, in promoting this book, Fly Away Home, and um, let me just say that I can endorse it heartily because the cover only sort of looks like a douche ad this time. <laughs> Does anybody have Best Friends Forever with them? Right, okay, so can you, can you hold it up so that we can all appreciate the douchiness? Oh, you don't have it with you. Wait, you don't travel with it everywhere? <laughs> it's not your, like, talisman? Well, okay. All right, well, see, there, there it is. Okay, right? So we have two women walking on the beach, and one of them looks like she's picking her swimsuit out of her ass crack. And, um, yeah. They, they sent me the cover. Uh, my publisher does this. That's nice of them. They send me the cover, and they're like, what do you think? And I'm like, I think it looks like a douche ad. And they're like, it doesn't look like a douche ad. I'm like, it totally looks like a douche ad. And it looks like that girl is picking a wedgie. And they're like, you're wrong. And I'm like, I'm not wrong. You know, and, and then they're like, well, all the book buyers in the stores really love it. And I'm like, okay, yay, douche ads, you know? I'm like, maybe we can do some like cross branding with Massengill, you know, like buy one, get one, you know? But, but then, they, then they send me this one and I'm like, motherfuckers, it's a douche ad again. <laughs> like this girl is like jumping in the air because she's glad that she doesn't have that not so fresh feeling anymore. <laughs> and her mom and her sister are like, isn't that nice, dear? Like, I'm really alarmed at some of the feminine hygiene ads, because have you seen the one where, where the woman looks all embarrassed because it's like she thinks she stinks? And it's like, really? Like, you know, I was, I was just very alarmed because my seven-year-old daughter was watching that, too. And I, but her whole thing is, like, she doesn't want to wear panties. She's seven. I, I didn't think I'd be having this fight with her this soon. <laughs> you know, it's like every morning, it's like, you know, did you wash your face? Did you brush your teeth? You got your panties on? Brittany, 
you know, but it's just not easy. So anyhow, okay, so I'm promoting my, my douchey book, and I go on the Rachel Ray show, and I bring my mom with me because I like to have my mom with me. And we get out of the car, and the security guard says, hey, you know, guess who just went up on the elevator? Guess what other guest is here today? Rosie O'Donnell. Okay, so my mom, as um, careful followers of my, my blog and Twitter feed might know, my mom is a gay lesbian woman, okay? So telling her that Rosie O'Donnell is in the building is, is sort of like telling a fundamentalist Christian that Jesus, <laughs> that Jesus Christ is in the green room <laughs> and he's having a cupcake. So my mother says, I have to meet Rosie. Like, she's forgotten all about me. Like, I'm, I'm not even there anymore. She's got to meet Rosie. So I ask my publicist if, if this could be possible, and my publicist approaches Rosie's publicist, and the two of them step into the hallway, and it is like watching two mafia dons try to broker a sit-down between the five families. Like, I don't even know what is being said. I don't know what is being promised, but, but eventually it, it all goes down, and, and my publicist says, you know, Fran, my mom, you can go meet Rosie. So I walk my mom back to Rosie's dressing room and and there is Rosie O'Donnell so of course first I have to stare and be like that's Rosie O'Donnell and um she looks at me and she says who are you and I didn't remember I, I it, it just fled from me and, and finally I'm like oh I, I'm Jennifer Weiner I'm another guest on the show I, I'm a novelist and she says what are your books about and I said well I, I wrote one about this girl and she was a reporter and she went through this bad breakup and her mom comes out of the closet and Rosie looks at my mother and says you and my mother says, yes. And Rosie says, how old were you? And my mom says, 54. And Rosie says, 54. She says, so you're sleeping with men for all those years. You're, you're having sex with men, and you're thinking, I don't know. This isn't great. I feel like there could be more. And I say, or less. <laughs> and my mom says, oh, Rosie, the first time a woman's lips touched mine, I'd never felt such ecstasy. And at this point, I like vomit in my mouth a little bit because like, you just don't want to hear that. I, you, I don't care how evolved you are, you just do not. So I'm like, okay, I, I gotta go. And I go back to my dressing room and I gotta put my Spanx on, which is like a good 15, 20 minute process. And I go back and they're still talking about sex. It's horrifying. I like, I blotted the whole thing out. I don't even want to know. Finally, finally, a producer comes and says, like, Miss O'Donnell, we need you on the set. So she, Rosie is walking away and she yells over her shoulder at me. She yells, send me your books. And then she keeps walking and she yells, actually, I'm rich. I can buy them. <laughs> so I thought that was awesome. Um, but I, I usually, I, I was actually proud of myself because I don't do well when I meet famous people. I, I tend to choke. It's, it's very, um, it's unfortunate. I, I did an event with Jeffrey Eugenides, who wrote Middlesex, which like won the National Book Award and was an Oprah pick. And, so, and he's this like lovely, reserved, like really shy man. And I, of course, you know, I, I want to talk to him because I read Middlesex and it made this huge impression on me. So I, I decide that, you know, in order to sort of like work up my courage, I need to have a glass of wine first. And a glass of wine becomes two glasses of wine. And finally, after three glasses of wine, I, I decide that I am ready. And I, I walk up to him and here's my opening line. I say, you're Jeffrey Eugenides. He says, yes. And I say, I loved your book, Middlesex. Have you guys read Middlesex? Do you know it's OK? It's about this um, person who is born and, and raised female, but it turns out is not female. It turns out has boy parts, right? So I say to Jeffrey Eugenides, I'm like, you know, when my daughter was born, I made the doctor look really close just to make sure there was nothing extra. <laughs> and he gets this look on his face of such disgust and horror. And he says, really? You really did that? I said, oh, come on, Jeff. I can't be the only one. Because I, I can't be. I can't be the only one who read Middlesex and, and, and made the pediatrician. I'm like, I don't want to be the mom who missed a penis. I think he left the party. It was just really. Um, so we need to talk about The Bachelorette. Is anybody, is any, yes? Okay, it's not my own little private problem that I'm having. Okay. The, the Bachelorette, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fill you guys in. I'm going to give you like the, the Cliff's Notes version. Okay, so last season it was Jake on The Bachelor. Jake was abs and crazy. 
we didn't know about the crazy. He just had abs in the in the show. And and Jake had to choose. He came on the show to look for love. I'm putting that all in quotes. And he had to choose between Tenley, who was the like sort of lovely, sweet, vivacious, like Disney princess kind of college admissions officer girl, and Vienna, who was a tramp. <laughs> and I know this was all in editing, and probably Vienna was very nice, and Tenley could have been evil. But so he picked Vienna, the tramp, and they ride off into whatever sunset is available to reality TV show couples. And then we move on to Allie, who was one of the bachelorettes, but had to choose between love and work and picked work. So majorly transgressive, right? So Allie's back, and she's in this house full of bachelors who are competing for her affection. And meanwhile, Jake and Vienna break up, right? They have this like horrible, horrible breakup, and so they have to come and be on TV in the middle of Allie's show. So they're sitting there, and they're talking to each other, and Jake says, well, you know, to Chris Harrison, who's the host of the show, he says, really, the problem was that Vienna was just not very supportive when I was on Dancing with the Stars. And I'm like, that happened to me once! <laughs> guy didn't support me when I was on Dancing with the Stars. And then Vienna says, well, you weren't there for me when my dog was in the hospital. And I'm like, these are silly people. <laughs> and then Jake says to Vienna, well, you're nothing but a fame whore. And Vienna says to Jake, you're the fame whore. And I'm thinking, kids, you guys met on a reality TV show. Like, <laughs> not like in the malt shop. So I'm thinking you're both fame whores. You know, and I just imagine like actual whores like watching this show and being like, leave us out of this. <laughs> okay, so then back to Allie. So one of, the, one of the gentlemen in the house is this professional wrestler named Justin. But Justin, it turns out, has a girlfriend. A girlfriend who lives in Canada. Now, I was only familiar with that phrase when used by gay guys trying to tell their moms that they weren't gay. Like, no, I've got a girlfriend you know, up, up north. You know? Like, do any of you guys know the musical Avenue Q? Yeah. Yes, where there's a song, right? I wish you could meet my girlfriend, my girlfriend who lives in Canada. Her name is Alberta. She lives in Vancouver. She cooks like my mother and sucks like a Hoover. So anyhow, so, <laughs> right. So, you know, they keep talking about the girlfriend in Canada, and then they show her, right? Okay, so she's on the phone. Her name is Jessie, and she's sitting there with her best friend, whose name is also Jessie, because in Canada there's only one name for girls, and it's Jessie. And they, um, she's on the phone with Allie, and she's like, yeah, we've been dating for two years. He said he'd marry me when he came off the show. So Allie, you know, the, 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 uh, the secret is out, and Allie confronts Justin, who gets very, very, like, defensive and angry and goes stomping through the shrubbery in what looks like a stormtrooper boot because he's hurt his foot. It's his... It's awesome TV. But so anyhow, so Allie has to give then her interview about the heartbreak that she suffered. And she looks at the camera and she says, after this betrayal, I just don't know if I can believe in love anymore. And I'm watching this with my husband and I say to him, you know what else she probably can't believe in is professional wrestling. You know, because she's going to watch and be like, fake, fake, girlfriend in Canada. And then Monday night, okay, so she's down to three guys. She's Roberto, who's really cute, Chris, whose mom is dead, which he mentions uh, every, like, minute or so, you know, and Frank, right? Now, I was worried about Frank because first Frank said he was in retail but never said what he sold, which, of course, I assume porn. And <laughs> it's just where my mind goes. I'm sorry. Um, okay, so, and then, but he's like, you know, I, I gave it all up to follow my dream of screenwriting. So I'm like, he lives at home. And he does. He lives at home in the, in the basement. So, but, but he also has a girlfriend, which just proves that any asshole can have a girlfriend. Because it's like, you have no job and you live at home in your parents' basement, but you have a girlfriend. So he has a girlfriend. And he went back to her Monday night, Nicole from Chicago. So then he had to tell Allie that he was going back to Nicole and it was like, but I was worried about him anyhow because the week before last he wore a shirt with cleavage and I just don't need to see men with cleavage. Like it was just, it was, it was really low cut, it was unfortunate. So um, somebody last night is like, who do you think will win? And I'm like, win is really a relative term with this. Like I, I don't, there are no winners on The Bachelor except Tristan Ryan who got married and, and Molly and Jason as somebody pointed out, they're still together, but I have doubts. So, um, so I'm going to talk about this book now, this book that I wrote. And um, so it's about a political scandal. And I, I remember watching the, um, the Elliot Spitzer mess. And I don't know if you guys remember that one. He was the governor of New York, and he had to go on TV and explain why he was spending $5,000 on escorts. You know, not only paying for sex, but overpaying for sex, which is really worse. And... 
And and I just remember watching that and just like being struck by so many things. And and one of them was the whole like five thousand dollars for sex thing. Like, what is a woman doing that is worth five thousand dollars? Should I be doing that thing <laughs> that is worth five thousand dollars? What would the male equivalent of the thing that is worth five thousand dollars be? Because like, if I'm spending that much money, I want my taxes done too. You know, like I want my windows washed, but. The, the whole money for sex thing is, is very interesting to me. I, I have a friend who has traveled extensively, and, and he went to a brothel in Thailand, or told me of a brothel in Thailand, where it's six stories high, and as you ascend each level, the women become more beautiful and more talented and more expensive. So he's telling me this story, and of course, all I can think about is what the job audition must be like. Like, if I for example, me, were to go apply for a job, like I'd show up with my resume and the, the madam would look at me and say, you, first floor woman. And I'd be like, but, but wait, I have a, a sparkling personality. <laughs> I'm really very, I'm funny. Um, you know, and, and I just, I, I had lots of questions like, you know, do you ever get demoted? Like, what if you're a fourth floor woman and then you have like a really rough weekend and you like come in for work and they're like, oh. And then I was like, is it handicapped accessible? Like, you know, if you want to purchase a sixth floor woman but can't get there, like, do they bring somebody down for you? And I had all these questions. And then the other night in Texas, like, where I'm doing the Q&A, and somebody's like, you know, very seriously says, if you weren't a writer, what would you be? And I just blurt out, first floor woman. And <laughs> But it's honestly, it's the only other thing that I could do that I could maybe get paid for. I don't know. It's, and, then, and then I retracted and said law school. Because it's, you know, that's, and then I'm like, no, that's worse. But anyhow. <laughs> All right, so, I, you know, Elliot Spitzer thing. And there, of course, is Silda. Silda Spitzer, like Ivy League educated, had a career, had a life, standing beside him. Why? And, and I wanted to write a story that would sort of answer that question as to like, why would a woman in this day and age stand by her man? And then what happens after the press conference? Like, is the conversation in the car on the way home awkward or the most awkward conversation ever? You know, I really wanted to get inside this woman's skin. And so I start writing this book about a cheating politician. And then of course I have the John Edwards thing. Um, and, and I just, I, I'm so furious at John Edwards because like I would come up with something that I thought was really funny and satirical and over the top and, and clearly in the realm of fiction and then I'd open the papers the next day and he'd be like, well, God damn it. You know, it's like, it's like okay, so he, he knocked up the campaign videographer and then he got this other staffer who I think is gay in love with him to say that he's the father and then he moved them all to a safe house in California that Bunny Mellon's donation is paying for? Like, what the fuck am I supposed to do about that? Like, you know, and then there's a sex tape, you know, and she's like pregnant and they're, I, all I could think of at that point was not just his wife, but his daughter, because he's got a 25 year old daughter. And I'm just imagining like, you know, if your parents have a sex tape, like so you're gonna wander across it somehow. And I just imagine this poor girl like clicking and being like, dad, pants, pants. <laughs> But, uh, you know, and then, like, I, I, the last year to me really felt like the year of the scandal, like the Tiger Woods thing. Like, I, I reference it in this book where it's like a clown car, where you open the door and then it's one woman, then another woman, and then another woman, and do, 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 do. they just keep coming out. And, and then the, the Jesse James, Sandra Bullock thing, where it's like, okay, you're this guy, you're this motorcycle guy, and you marry this woman who is by all accounts like lovely and talented and generous and beautiful and has just won the Academy Award, and you're cheating on her with a chick with a tattooed forehead. Why? But you know, as my, my best friend Susan likes to remind me, like when Halle Berry was married to Dave Justice, he was cheating on her. So it's like, if Halle Berry gets cheated on, like what hope is there for the rest of us? Like what, what more does a man want if you have, she's Catwoman, for God's sake. <laughs> you don't step out on Catwoman. Ugh. And then the Al Gore thing, which like I did not see that coming. That's what she said. Yeah. <laughs> You know, but I, I just, I, like, the idea, okay, first of all, if you book a three-hour massage, like, there's, you're going to run out of stuff to rub after, like, two hours, and it's just, it's just not going to go well. And, and, you know, but I can imagine him, like, holding the woman down and being like, we're going to talk about your carbon footprint, but, like, not the sex stuff. <laughs> it's just so weird. 
All right, so I'm going to read to you a little bit, a little bit here from Flyway Home. So basically, Sylvie, um, it has been revealed that Sylvie's husband was cheating on her. They've had the press conference, which she has attended. Basically, I, I made her decide to do it so her daughters wouldn't have to, that she's going to stand up there with him so that they won't be co-opted into this spectacle. And then she ditches her husband, and she goes up to her grandmother's old house in Connecticut. And in the scene I'm going to read, she's grocery shopping for the first time in years and years because she hasn't been to a grocery store. Her, her nutritionist has bought her groceries. So... Back to the meat aisle for another whole chicken, then a box of egg noodles. Over to the bakery for corn muffin and cinnamon rolls. Not as good as seals, but they looked okay, and an okay corn muffin was still good. Wasn't that what men said about sex? Or was it pizza? That even bad pizza's still good? Bad pizza. Probably that was what she was to Richard, the cheap freezer burn stuff you'd pull out from the back of the shelf when you were ravenous and desperate enough not to care. Maybe that girl, that Joelle, had been fresh baked, right out of the oven, her cheese all hot and stretchy, the dough soft and yielding. Sylvie grabbed a loaf of French bread and a small round loaf of raisin challah, then put on her glasses to peer at a price tag when she noticed a young woman in a Nike visor staring at her. Sylvie dropped her eyes. Then she raised her chin, her jaw set defiantly. Can I help you? Excuse me, the woman began. I was wondering. Sylvie cut her off. Yes, she said, that's right, I am. The woman stared. Sylvie decided some amplification was necessary. I'm Sylvie Woodruff, Richard Woodruff's wife, and I didn't know he was sleeping with that girl, and I haven't decided if I'm divorcing him yet, and in case you were wondering, we still had what I consider to be a perfectly acceptable sex life. We loved each other. Her eyes were filling with tears. She blinked them away. We had two daughters, Diana and Lizzie. Diana's a doctor, and Lizzie, well, Lizzie had some problems, but I think she's doing better now, and this is completely derails her, which I worry about. I do, I worry about it a lot, and I'm furious at my husband for jeopardizing her. She swallowed the word recovery and swiped at her cheek with her sleeve. I guess what I have to figure out is can I ever forgive him? Can I trust him again? Can we be a family? And I don't know. After something like this, I just don't know. I'm sorry, the woman whispered. Sylvie held her round challah tightly. Sorry, she repeated. Yeah, I'm sorry, too. I'm sorry I didn't see it coming. I thought I had a happy marriage. I thought I did. We said I love you every night. We never went to sleep angry. But you don't know. It could happen to anyone. Like getting struck by lightning. It could happen to anyone. Her voice was hoarse and loud. She could feel herself sweating as her fingertips sank through the plastic and into the bread. Nobody likes to think it, but it could happen to anyone. This was not technically true. Sylvie supposed it happened much more frequently to powerful men who had ample opportunity. But at that moment, with her heart thundering in her ears and sweat rolling down her back, it felt true. Like a natural disaster, an earthquake, a tsunami, and her only mistake was that she'd been in the way. Anyone, she repeated. The woman finally opened her mouth again. I just, I, I wanted to ask. I parked next to a Camry with its lights on, and I wondered if that was your car. <laughs> oh. Well, that could happen to anyone, too, Sylvie said, feeling her face burn as the woman backed away. I'm sorry for your troubles, the woman whispered. Oh, no, said Sylvie, her old social graces taken o taking over. No, I'm, I'm not myself right now. She tried to give a little, my isn't this an amusing misunderstanding laugh, but it sounded more like a sob. Really, I'm fine. The woman nodded, managed a weak smile, then fled in the direction of ethnic foods. Sylvie stood for a moment, her hands on the handle of the shopping cart. That had not gone well. So that's a little snippet. How do I find I use my journalism background? I mean, honestly, journalism taught me so much about being a good observer and listening to the way people talk and watching how they stand and, uh, you know, just body language and clothes, details, being in people's houses, seeing people's cars, like all that stuff that you just sort of pick up, you know, working a beat. Um, and the other thing journalism did, I think, was really sort of de-romanticize the writing process in a good way. Because when you're a reporter and you have to write a story and it's due at 6 o'clock, you can't really go to your boss at 6 and be like, you know, I am sorry, but my muse has not spoken to me about this sewage board hearing that I covered, so there's no story. You know, your boss does not care about your muse, and so you just have to write and really get used to writing, writing on deadline, writing for length, writing every day, writing more than one thing at once. And I think all of that was 
excellent, excellent training for writing novels. So I, I consider myself really lucky to have had a life in newspapers. And I, I feel bad because, you know, people for years, people are just like, you know, I want to be a novelist. What should I do? And I'm like, well, if you can't find a way, you know, if you can't find somebody to like be a patron of the arts for you and support you while you write that novel, like journalism's great, but I don't know where the jobs are anymore. I think they've all moved online. And, you know, so that's, where people have to go. But no, I would, I would recommend journalism highly to anyone who wants to write novels. It worked for me. Novel around reality-based TV. Is that the question? Oh my god. Um, <laughs> you know, for years I've had this fake show that I've tried to get into my books where it's called Diet Island, OK? And it's a cross between Survivor and The Biggest Loser. Because, okay, have you noticed that everybody on Survivor lose, loses weight, or at least they used to. Now they're giving them too much food. But they used to lose, like, a lot of weight. So I had this idea that it would be a contest. You would drop 20 people on an island with, like, a bag of rice and a book of matches and Vaseline for the chafing. And um, you would, they, you know, they, they would have to survive. And then the winner would be the one who lost the most weight. Like, maybe they wouldn't know it was a weight loss competition. Like, maybe they'd think it was, like, Survivor. But it would die at island. Can't you see that? See, I, I don't know if I want to write a book about it or actually do the show. Like, I, I think that would be kind of fun. <laughs> I, need a, I need a good, like, kicker, like, Diet Island, like, where, where fat goes to vacation or something like that. I don't know. I also have an idea for a movie called Black Pope, where, it's the, where there's a, a black pope, as the title implies. And, and that's, all I really have is the title and the kicker, but the kicker is, don't tell him he vat a can't. That, that's all I got. I got nothing, but I, I think I could do it. I think that's enough, don't you? <laughs> My brother is a producer in Hollywood, and he works in the same building as the Wayans brothers, so every time I go visit him, I threaten to go pitch Black Pope, and he's like, don't do it. See, I, I actually, there was actually more to it where there'd be like twin brothers and like one of them was like a really good devout, like a bishop or something who'd like, you know, he could legitimately have become Pope, but then he had like the, the ne'er-do-well brother who was like trying to make like cheap porno movies and like, you know, was, and, and then like there'd be some big mix up and the bad brother would have to like be the fake Pope for a weekend and I, it, I had this whole thing and <laughs> nobody liked it. <laughs> Black Pope. Somebody over here, I can't believe I just told it that black book. <laughs> None of you guys better steal that. <laughs> My family, oh Lord love them. Um, well, let's see. Um, I, I'm the oldest of four, and my, my mom is, is gay, and she discovered this, like I, I said, she was 54, and she um, met this woman named Karen. Um, <laughs> in the, they met in the swimming pool of the West Hartford JCC. Do, are there Jews in here? Is anybody? Okay, good. Thank you. You can explain it to the rest of them later. At the J. They met at the J. And, um, you know, for years I would come home and my mom would say, hey, do you want to come swimming? And I'd be like, oh, hell no. <laughs> and she'd say, it's not catching. And I'd say, they haven't proved that. Um, so Karen was kind of awful. Like, she was sort of like the first girlfriend. She was much, much younger than my mom. And she didn't like men, which was a problem, because I have brothers. I, like, I have a sister and two brothers. So like, but I remember bringing my, my then fiance home, and she looked at him, and she said, I don't have much use for your kind. <laughs> but you, you're different. You've got little delicate hands. And so for, my husband does. He has little small hands. So for years, I'd be like, hey, delicate hands. <laughs> um, so a, a lot of people want to know how my family feels about basically being fodder for my, my books and my stories. And they're mostly really OK with it. Um, you know, my deal is, like, there are writers who say that you can never let your family, like you can't worry about what they're going to think of your books because you're writing for posterity and you're writing for the ages and blah, blah, blah. And I don't know where these people go for Thanksgiving, but like I got to go home. So I, anybody gets to, like anybody who shows up in a book, they get to read it when it's in galleys. And basically if there's a problem, they just tell me and I change it. And I, I've been able to sort of use whatever I want with the one exception. My mother's life partner, Claire's sister, Carla, has a thing for amputees. And I really want to use that in a book. And because um, I have so many questions, like, 
first of all, you go to Carla and Claire's parents' house and you like flip through the books and it's like it's it's like a, a pictorial history of prosthetics because there was like the guy in the eighties with the hook. You know, and then the guy in the 90s with, like, the mechanical hand. And so, like, I just, I, I wanted to know, first of all, like, where do you meet amputees? Like, do you do you hang out outside the prosthetic shop and, like, wait for, like, a likely prospect and be like, hey, handsome. You need a hand with that? But, um, you know, she just, like, she is adamant. She's like, you can't use it. You can't use it. And then, like, she made me... Like she, I, I finally was just like, okay, I won't use it, but you just have to tell me what it's about. So she made me sign a tablecloth in a clam shack, promising that I would never use it in a book. And then she told me it was a sex thing, and I couldn't even hear anymore. I was just like, <laughs> but um, th no, like they're, you know, they're they're all cool. I have two daughters, um, Lucy who doesn't wear underpants, and, and Phoebe who's not potty trained yet. So um, you know, they're both they're both very nice and and interesting and lively girls. They're both very funny. Um, and uh, they, they have curly hair that I don't know what to do with because they got the Jufro from my husband. And I just, I, Lucy, the one thing I can use in her hair that works is called Mixed Chicks Conditioner. And I feel like guilty buying it because like I'm, she's not mixed, but it works. So I don't know. I, I feel like I'm supporting the community in some small way. <laughs> Did you want to know anything more specific? <laughs> no? Black Pope? See, in the first scene where the brother would be doing the, okay. No, no, this is good, okay. He's gonna like, he's trying to convince his girlfriend to like do like the amateur porno. So she's in the shower and he's like, okay, baby, just like be sexy, be sexy. And she's just like very business, like, you know, giving herself a shower. And then he's like, just be natural. Just pretend I'm not here. So she starts giving herself the breast exam because she's got the card hanging from the shower head. And he's like, not that natural. Well, let me, let me just offer a disclaimer. I hardly ever look this good. Like, and this is sort of looking good for me, but like, I, I never, it's very rare that somebody will ever like recognize me out in the world from my author photo. And when they do, I know it's time to get a better author photo with even more airbrushing. But um, the, uh, being a writer isn't like being like any other kind of famous person because you're not, it's just the picture, you know, like even, well, I don't know, maybe social media has changed that because if you're like on Facebook and on Twitter and you're interacting with people and I think that maybe they start feeling like they do know you in, in a way that's sort of the exact opposite, I think, of like a movie star's mystique. Like I think that that was sort of like, you know, the movie stars of the, the you know, like Cary Grant and Greta Garbo. It's like we didn't know them and they were these big, beautiful mysteries that we wanted to solve. And, and then there's me that's like, you know, tweeting about like who I'm stuck next to on the airplane. Um, but I, I think that the, I, you're asking about sort of fame in the process, right? Like I, I think the thing that's changed as sort of the books have, you know, have gone on and have sold, it's sort of, you know that there's an audience waiting. Like when you're writing your first book and you're like all alone in your spare bedroom and, um, you know, in your sweatpants because you've been dumped and you're writing this book because you have nothing else to do because you have no more social life, which was my story with Good in Bed. You know, you, you have all these daydreams of like, you know, I'm going to get an agent. I'm going to get an editor. I'm going to have a huge publishing contract. And, you know, people will, will fawn over me and they'll fall at my feet. And, you know, even if you do get the agent and the editor and the publishing contract, the people falling at your feet does, does not happen that, that much because really you only get to sort of like put on the author clothes like a couple weeks a year when your book comes out and you're on tour and maybe you get to be on TV. But the thing that happens is after that first book, you know there's people waiting. You know your agent is waiting and your editor's waiting and your readers are waiting and you don't want to disappoint them. And you know, and you want to sort of always be pushing yourself and challenging yourself as a writer, but you also want to give your readers enough of what they love you for in the first place and, and you know, keep them happy. And that, I'd say, is the interesting tension, is sort of you never have that freedom of sort of writing that first book all alone in, in the quiet of your head again. And that, I think, like, you know, it's not like you're getting bothered for autographs in the grocery store, but I do think that that, as, as you become sort of more and more popular as a writer, that is the thing that you lose and that's sort of the the thing you have to fight to retain somehow is the sense of it's just you and the page was I happy with the movie yeah. I was yeah I mean the one thing I, I wasn't like the one like quibble that I have is that I wanted Tony Collette to be bigger 
because like when they cast when they cast her I was thrilled because she'd been in Muriel's wedding and she'd gained 40 pounds and I was like okay fantastic like she's going to gain weight to play Rose who's supposed to be bigger and I would get these calls from Hollywood and they'd be like okay she gained 10 pounds she gained 12 pounds she gained 15 pounds and then they, they called me and they're like she's hit the wall and I was like there's a wall the wall I don't believe the wall and I have ever met you know um I was like do they need me to come out and help her because I, I feel that I could do this and you know I I'll bring some Krispy Kremes and like I'll pitch a black pope and you know but the the thing that I did like I, I have a friend who's a film critic and she gave me like a really good piece of advice when the um, script was sold and people were like well are you gonna adapt it and my friend said a novelist trying to adapt her own material is like a mother trying to circumcise her own son she said let someone else do the cutting and I said okay um, I just had a baby and I, I just sort of like made up my mind in my head I was just like I told the story I wanted to tell in the book. It's done, it's between the pages, it's in bookstores, no one's gonna change it. I'm gonna let the movie be the filmmaker's story. And if it's great, that's fantastic. And if it's just okay, it's still gonna bring people to my book. And that's a good thing. Um, so yeah, I, I really was pleased. I, I, was, I was glad they kept the characters Jewish because I, I figured that would be like maybe something they would change. I was glad they shot it in Philadelphia instead of like going to Canada with like a styrofoam Liberty Bell, um, you know, to find all those Canadian girlfriends. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I was I was really happy, but I, I that's the advice. Like when other friends who are writers, when their stuff gets optioned, I'm like, cash the check quickly, try not to think about it too much because the, the truth is, like the vast majority of things that get optioned never get made. So you just sort of like take the money and, and smile politely and are grateful, and then just go on to your next book. I mean, there there have been legendary stories in Hollywood about authors who've like wasted, like Wally Lamb, I think is sort of the, the classic cautionary tale, who spent years writing a screenplay for She's Come Undone. And there have been so many actresses and directors attached and it still hasn't gotten made. And you just wonder like, you know, could he have written a great book with, with that time? So, but yeah, I was, I was happy. Would I consider having another of my books? Yeah, I'd love it. I mean, but, but honestly, like, I don't want to be greedy. Like, I had what I think was just about the perfect experience of sort of the book to film thing. And, you know, but it was also really stressful. I mean, it was sort of like, you know, you're, you're in the press like a million times more with a movie than you are as just a writer. And that was, you know, it was a, I, I'm a private person. <laughs> Okay, not really, but um, yeah, you know, I, I would like it okay. I, I, I would not kick it out of bed for eating crackers. <laughs> My favorite character, wow. Um, oh, God, you know, it's like asking a mother to pick her favorite child. Like, you're really not supposed to do that in public. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I like Janie Siegel from Goodnight Nobody, Janie Siegel of the Carpet Siegels who's like, you know, I, I like that moment where like she's this rich girl who sort of has to like make it on her own because her father has cut her off and she's, I like that moment when she and Kate are gonna go apartment hunting and Kate's like, you know, we're gonna be walking a lot so wear comfortable shoes and Janie makes a note for herself. She writes, wear comfortable shoes and then she thinks for a minute and writes, buy comfortable shoes. <laughs> so she was fun. Um, so that's it, I'm getting the hook. I'm gonna sit right there. I'm gonna sign your books. Thank you all for coming.